Well, uh, the last um, couple weeks, uh, as we've been looking uh, at Acts chapter 17, um, and we've been seeing uh, Paul be in Athens, uh, we've seen the way that he's been interacting with people really of different faiths and um, of different backgrounds um, in, a, in a pluralistic uh, society, much like the one that we live in today, much like the one that you see even over in Israel, uh, but a pluralistic society that has so many different viewpoints on God. And we've been looking a lot at uh, the, the idea of, of inroads, um, identifying from all these different people, what are some inroads that we can sort of connect with or latch onto so we can find a way into their world, into their hearts, into uh, their worldview, so that we can have meaningful conversations, uh, not just small talk, but meaningful conversations so we can really connect on a heart level. Um, that's what we've been looking at the last uh, couple weeks, and we're gonna be looking at that more uh, this week, uh, incarnating ourselves into the lives of others. So um, I wanna just pray and just dive right into Acts chapter 17. We're gonna be looking again at verse 24 to 28, uh, but let's, um, let's pray and ask the Lord just to, uh, to be with us, uh, to encourage us through his word, uh, and to work in our hearts uh, as his people. Uh, Father, thank you for your word. We thank you that uh, you've gathered us to be able to open up your word, uh, that we live, again, uh, in a uh, relatively uh, very free uh, world where we can do this and we can gather together uh, and encourage each other in the word of God. Um, we don't want to take this for granted. This is not guaranteed. It's not guaranteed in the world. It's not guaranteed in our future. Uh, so we want to make the best of every moment you give us together. Help us to take in your word today, that it would work in our hearts as it does because it is alive, it is active, and we, we need it. So Holy Spirit, would you drive this word into our hearts today that it would find a home within us. We thank you that your word is alive because you, Jesus, you're alive. And we're amazed by that. So we thank you for your power and your work in us. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. So Acts chapter 17, verse 24. This is when Paul is talking to the Athenians. It's a sermon, if you will. Uh, more of a dialogue or discussion, but uh, for our purposes, it's kind of like a sermon. He says, The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man, speaking of Adam, he made from one man every nation and mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. So the first thing I'd, I'd want to remind ourselves of as we go into the same text this week is the fact that we are all image bearers of God you're never going to meet ever in your life. You'll never see anyone on TV or in the news, even the people that we've been seeing this weekend, terrorists. You'll never see anyone in this life that is not made in the image of God. And that should change the way that we see everyone, from people we know in person to people we see on the news. Every single human being that's ever walked this planet, that's ever been conceived in the womb, was made in the image of God. And the next thing that Paul points out here is that everyone that you have met in this life or anyone that your eyes have run across on TV or in the news, they were all brought before your eyes by the one who has determined those as he calls it, as Paul calls it, those various allotted periods and boundaries of their life and of your life. Right? What Paul's saying is that God has determined the times, the places in which you live. 
That means he's determined the times and places in which your neighbor lived and the times and places in which those terrorists in the news have lived. And somehow by his divinity, by his sovereignty, he placed those people on TV right before your eyes and the people in your neighborhood right before your eyes. This is all God's doing. So we're all made in the image of God and each one of us, as we interact with each other, whether in person or on our devices or whatever, we have to know that these people in our lives have been brought before us, whether in person or visually, have been brought before us by a sovereign God. And this has all been for a purpose. He made this happen for a reason. Now I want you to consider now how, how our world is today. This is in your notes. We were created in the image of God, we were created for in-person communion, face-to-face -face communion with each other. That's how we were created to have. But today we settle on digital connection, by and large. And we call that connection. I'm not saying it's not connection, but we settle on that as if that's kind of ultimate or satisfactory connection. We're made in the image of God. We're made for in-person communion, face-to-face in the flesh, tactile, hugs, handshakes, fist bumps, sitting across, just being in each other's presence. That's what we're made for. And yet we, today, we, we largely settle on digital connection. So we've got communion versus connection. Very similar, but yet very different. Very different. So much of life today is lived through devices. And, and don't get me wrong, I love the many, many benefits of devices. I love especially good, meaningful conversations over text or FaceTime or whatever it is. I love all the articles I get to read. I love the sermons I get to watch. I love being able to keep track with my son who's off to college. I, I love to be able to keep track with my mom who lives six hours away. I love all the great benefits of technology. But as I've mentioned a lot in the last couple months, especially in the, the parenting workshops and some other places, every bit of technology, and I don't just mean digital technology, I mean automobiles, indoor heating and plumbing, every bit of technology always has unintended consequences. Things that kind of come with it as a package deal, right? How amazing are automobiles? But how many people die in automobiles, right? They, they all come with consequences that we either maybe knew that this is going to be a thing, but it's still worth the risk, whatever it might be. And so we have all these great things, like these devices that keep us truly connected with so many people, but then that kind of becomes the primary way or the satisfactory way by which we connect with people. And that part's not good because that's not how we're made to live. That's not how we're made to live. We were made for something more, something deeper, something better because we're made in the image of God. And so while we should totally enjoy the benefits of these great things that we've created, but we also have to understand that something's been lost in our lives. I know something's been lost in my life. And I've gained a lot too by technology. But I've lost something in the process. Because of all this stuff that we have now, there's been this kind of lost art or maybe even a value over things like hospitality, and relationship, being present with someone, and then, not just when you're with them, but you're actually attentive, and not looking at your phone even when you're in person with somebody, but face-to-face -face love and relationship that can't be duplicated by our devices. Devices can maybe give us more frequency, but they can't give us the same quality. We can have more quantity in how much we talk to people, but the quality isn't there. And it can't be there. Even the, the best VR, the best AI, the best whatever, cannot replace what it means to be in person with another image bearer. Hearing their voices, I mean, I don't think we understand sometimes because we, we take it for granted, but, you know, voice and sound, it's all vibration, right? So when you're sitting there, you don't really necessarily feel it, but when someone's talking across the table, your body feels the vibration of their voice. You can't put your finger on it, you can't, you wouldn't 
necessarily know it, but it's different than reading words or even FaceTime. There's just something different about being present with people. Now, the good news for us is that this value of in-person presence is actually built into our beliefs as Christians. Our examples of Christ and the early church, them spending so much time together, those are our ultimate examples, the commands that are in the scriptures. This is built into our faith, not necessarily that we're doing it, so I'm not saying we're doing it well, but at least for us, we, we don't settle on it. Remember how the, the Athenians, uh, they just sat around just always wanting to talk about the new thing, the new thing, the new thing, right? The world is much like that. The world would be very content with a world just of maybe VR and, and AI and everything kind of doing that so we can sort of you know, create our own world and we can stay very isolated. But as believers, we're going, hey, some of that's great. Some of that's maybe exciting or fun or entertaining or whatever or truly helps us connect with people. But we also know because it's built into our DNA spiritually as believers that that's not enough. It's not enough. We're built for more. Our Savior is our example. The early church is our example. The commands of Paul and other parts of the scriptures are our example that we are to be with one another in person. I know that, at least for me and I think for a lot of us, this is, we've gotten really rusty on this. We, we were getting rusty already because of technology in general. Uh, I, mean, I mean, even system, simple things like take an automobile, like, you know, we can... We can now live miles apart from each other. Now, the great thing is the convenience of cars makes us able to get all these places, but it also means that we're living further apart from one another, right? So there's not as much as a neighbor dropping by. That's kind of a lost thing these days, right? Now, nowadays, like back in the day, if someone, you know, rang the doorbell, you're like, oh, hey, who's here? Now it's like, hey, who's here? <laughs> Hide, <laughs> right? It's, it's just a different world. So we've lost a lot of this art of hospitality and communion with each other, frequency of in-person relationship. And I think we've already, we're losing that because of technology, but I, I really think that the after effects of COVID and lockdowns and spending uh, an extra amount of time online during that era has really had so many more changes in our lives than maybe that we even acknowledge. I think we're so much more now tuned into technology and everything because we lived like that for a while. And it's changed us, maybe even permanently as a society. Right? There's a lot of advances even during that time and a lot of people getting used to things they thought they would never get used to. I mean, how many people never thought they'd ever like FaceTime or Zoom and now it's like that's a pretty commonplace thing these days in workplaces and relationships and a lot's changed. And the world might get excited and go all in on all the advances in every way. And again, I'm not saying I don't enjoy many of those advances because I totally do. But the world, as I mentioned, is a lot like those Athenian philosophers. Remember what they specifically said here in Acts 17, 21. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. I mean, that just, that sounds a lot like today. Right, with the new gadget, the new thing. Did you hear about this? Did you hear about that? Oh, you've got that old one. We, we love, we love, the world loves to see progress. The world is all in on progress. And the world sees things like this, just uh, getting excited about telling or hearing something new, new philosophies, new way of thinking, whatever it might be. We're undoing the past and all this kind of stuff. The world loves this stuff. They see it all as progress. And while some things like technology and some of the things we've been afforded, like hospitals, for instance, some of these technologies are truly progress for us. And they're good. But as Christians, we know that not all progress is created equal. Not all progress is good. It depends on where it's progressing toward. Right? Progress is good if it's going towards a good thing. <laughs> if it's going towards something that is going to truly maybe bring God glory and enrich our lives as believers, deepen our faith, deepen our relationships with one another, deepen and, and get us more excited about things like sharing our faith, but some progress does not move us towards those things. Some progress takes us away from those things. Some progress actually 
might look really progressive and exciting, but it actually isolates us from people, isolates us from the church and from Christians and from fellowship, but also isolates us from even sharing the gospel with people because we're just kind of getting sucked into our own little world and we're creating and cultivating and curating our own little world. So we have to understand that not all progress is good and that even good progress has unintended consequences that might affect us in ways that we don't necessarily recognize. So as Christians, we need to be discerning. We need to be wise because sometimes this progress is progressing us towards disconnection which is kind of ironic, right? Like a lot of this progress, technological progress, is bringing us towards deeper connection with people, more frequent connection, more real life connection. You can see people, all this kind of stuff, but it's actually bringing us towards disconnection. Or maybe I should say discommunion. Maybe we're more connected, but we're more discommuned. More, a more accurate way of seeing this. Now, thankfully for us, we have a mandate from God's word to recognize some of these lazy drifts that we get into, some of these things that we settle on, we have a command from God's word, a mandate from God's word to not let all these good things like in-person relationship just go by the wayside because, oh, look at these advances. We have a mandate from the word to recognize some of these bad practices and we have the ability to change them. So look again at Acts chapter 17 Verse 24, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, he does not let live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needs anything. God is not served by human hands. He does not need our service. He does not need our time. He does not need our money. He does not need us. Since he himself is the one who gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. God has given us all things. This might draw our minds to the very words of Jesus from Matthew chapter 20, verse 26. He says, whoever would be great among you, great among you, you must, he, uh, he must be your servant, must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus didn't come here because he needed us. He didn't come to be served by us. He came to serve us because we need him. And Jesus tells us, the exact reason why he came to the world. He says, I came to serve. I came to serve. That is a central Christian claim. Christ, the Son of God, became a servant for us. And he lived among us. Why did he do this? He did not come in need of us. He came not because he needed what we have to offer him, but because we needed him. And he tells us the main way that he serves us in the rest of that verse. He serves us in order to give himself as a ransom for many. What we need most of all was someone who would die in our place and pay our penalty for sin. That's his primary way that he serves us. He came to serve he himself even, he himself had an allotted time, to, to take Paul's words here, that God gave allotted times and allotted dwelling places, boundaries for us to live in, that God sovereignly chose for you and for me a time and a season and a place to live. Jesus also entered into his own allotted time on this earth and a boundary by which he dwelled on this earth, a specific time in history a specific place in history. He subjected himself to the same thing that we are. And he came and he lived in that place. He went to the first century Israel, lived in Nazareth, lived in Capernaum, lived in Jerusalem, met with lepers, tax collectors, prostitutes, all image bearers, outcasts, fishermen, and Pharisees. 
He put on first century clothes and he worked a first century job, a secular job as a carpenter. He didn't go into the ministry when he was younger. He was a construction worker. That's what he did. He entered into this world in his allotted time, in his boundaries, and dwelt among face-to-face with image bearers who were not all like him. I mean, no one's like him. But face-to-face with all these different people. And he did this all in his allotted period and boundary of his dwelling place, serving people, serving strangers, even serving his enemies. And today we're a very disconnected people, maybe connected digitally, but not communally. And so hospitality has become a lost art for us. And we have the perfect opportunity in our own allotted period, in our own boundaries of our dwelling place to change that. We have the perfect opportunity because we don't need the world to serve us, do we, church? We don't need the the world to serve us. Now, We want the world to serve us. We want the world to bow down to us and our values and our morals and do everything to make our lives better. We want the world to serve us. But church, we gotta get into our heads and hearts. We do not need the world to serve us because we have God Almighty. We don't need the world to serve us. Church, the world needs us to serve them. And specifically, the world needs us to serve them with the message of the gospel that Jesus is the ransom for their sins. Because we're image bearers and because we're Christians, we don't just bear his image, but now we bear his message and now we bear his mission. So as he came not to be served but to serve, now we also say, I'm not here to be served, world. I'm here to serve tax collectors, Pharisees, outcasts, my neighbors, and not just digitally. And again, there's a place for all of that. But in person, flesh to flesh, eye to eye. I'm here to serve, not to be served. Because I'm made in the image of my Savior, my Redeemer, my Protector, my Defender. Church, the world needs us. They don't want us. They don't want us at all. But they do need us because we've been given the words to eternal life. We've been given the one who's given himself as a ransom for many. But just knowing that this is true is is not enough for us. Just wanting to become more hospitable and and have more face-to-face time with people, that's not enough. It's not enough just to want these things, to want to become more welcoming and more open. Just wanting it, church, is not enough. It can bubble over in our hearts, we can say it, but just wanting it is not enough. And here's what I'd like to share with you guys, a little bit of what I shared yesterday with the, the guys up there, with, uh, with the boys. What I did is I, I had the boys, a lot of the boys, the young boys, are, they're baseball players. So I said, I mean, you guys are play sports, baseball, soccer, maybe you're into music, maybe into art. Uh, and, you know, they raised their hand and kind of said the different things that they're into. And and I asked them, I said, you know, do you guys want to get really good at baseball? Do you want to get really good at art, really good at music? And they said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, is it, is it enough just to want to get really good? Can you just like want it? And so, you know, in a few years, you're going to be a really great baseball player in high school. Is, is that enough? And of course, they say no. So what I did is I actually had the boys, I had a wiffle ball bat. I had the boys come up. I, I wanted just three to come up, but of course, that's never going to work. So like 20 boys came up. Um, and I said, I want all you boys to give me your best swing. Show me your best swing. And so they're, they're swinging, and they look pretty good, right? Different age levels. And then I said, all right, I want all you boys to give me your worst swing possible. I want you to just give me a terrible swing. And so they just are throwing the bat around, and, uh, and they just were doing the worst swings you've ever seen in your life, right? And they're all laughing at each other. And so I asked, I said, um, I, I, I picked on one of them, I think. It might have been, um, been Dempsey, I can't remember. I said, Dempsey, how old are you? And I said, how, how, when are you going to be in high school? And he's like, oh, four or five years. I guess. So, so I said, boys, if, if Dempsey does his bad swing for the next four or five years, the one he did where he just kind of threw the bat on the ground, if he does that for four or five years in a row, how do you think he's going to be as a baseball player when he gets into high school? And they're like, terrible. Said, right, yeah. So what does he have to do? 
And they're like, change this swing. I'm like, right, you, you got to change your swing. Is it enough for him? But what if, what if Dempsey really wants so badly to be a really great high school baseball player? He wants to go to Major League Baseball and play, but he keeps doing that same thing. Is it enough for him just to want it badly? And they said, no, no. I said, so what does he got to do? He's got to change his swing. He's got to practice the right reps, the right kind of swing. He has to stop doing this. And he's got to start doing this instead. And he's got to start now. Because I asked him, I said, well, can he start maybe when he's a sophomore in high school? No. No, he starts now at his age now. Don't wait until later. Well, eventually, I'll start working at the thing that I really want to have in my future. Can't do that. you got to start now. Start doing those reps now. It's not enough just to want something and hope for something. We have to start doing those things now. And so I asked the boys, you know what? reps mean and they they knew they said repetitions and i said so boys if you do if you do bad reps you do a bad thing over and over again you're gonna get really good at doing bad things but we want to get good at doing good things and we can't just hope for it so then i said hold that thought boys let's let's tie this in i want to just talk about life right now how do we then, boys, I said, what do you guys see in your future? What would you guys love to be in like 10, 20 years and said, you know, I want to have a good job. You know, I want to have a house. And I said, okay, do you want a good job or do you want a really terrible job? I want a good job. All right, do you, what kind of house do you want? What kind of future do you want? Is it enough just to want those things, boys? And I go, no. I said, so boys, you can't just hope for this stuff. Even at your age now, seven, eight, nine, you have to start thinking, how do I become the kind of person I want to become in the future? And you can't just hope for this. So, so I'm looking at us now today. Now let's go come back to us. And we hear this stuff. We go, okay, I, I know I've, I've lost a little bit of this hospitality edge to me. I know I've gotten really busy in life. I've gotten a little bit too much online. I don't hang out with people in person as much as I'd like to. I haven't been really a great neighbor or a great friend. Or, or I haven't been really given a lot of time to my, my extended family who doesn't see things. My way. Whatever it is. You go, yep, I know it's wrong. I need, I need to really, I need to change. I'm telling you, it's not enough just to want that. It's not enough just to hope that somehow that magically happens in our life. We have to make changes now and today. And one thing I told the boys is, you don't try to change your swing like 27 different things and all of a sudden you have this major league baseball ready swing by next week. Right? You start small, you, you tweak one thing in your swing and that's it. And just do that one thing over and over and over again. Then after a while, you add another thing. And then after a while, you add another thing. And eventually, you get to high school, and you've got a much more, a prettier swing than you did when you're seven. But you start small, and you do the small things well and repetitively over and over and over again. And you get, you get better at that. So I, I shared this scripture with them from 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. Paul says to Timothy, train yourself for godliness. And I asked them, I said, do you guys know what to train means? I said, yeah, it means to work, to practice. I said, right, whether it's, whether it's drawing or if it's soccer or baseball or whatever, you have to train yourself if you want to get better at that thing. Paul says, if we want to grow in godliness, it's not enough just to hope for it. Or just to say, yeah, I want to become a godly young man. That, that doesn't work. Paul says you have to train yourself the word train in Greek here is gymnazo. It means to go to the gym, right? Like we are working out. We are working ourselves to grow in our godliness. Not just hoping, not just wishing. I also shared Hebrews chapter five, verse 14 with them. And I had to simplify this because there's a lot of big words here, but I'll just read it for us. For those who have their powers of discernment. So, so the author of Hebrews is saying people who have Really good discernment, powerful discernment, powerful wisdom. Those who have their powers of discernment tr trained themselves. Same word here. Went to the gym, worked themselves, trained themselves by constant practice. We're talking reps here. Reps. Constant practice so that they could distinguish good and evil. They worked themselves so they could gain this discernment constant practice. 
And I asked the boys, I said, you know what we call changing your, your swing in Christianity? There's a word that Christians use for changing your swing. And they're going, well, are you serious? That's, that sounds silly. I said, the word is repentance. The word's repentance. Because to repent means to go from this direction and change directions. Because repentance isn't just simply stop doing this. Repentance is stop doing this and instead do this. Repentance isn't just judging us for what we're doing wrong. It's the Holy Spirit guiding us towards the right thing, towards life, towards godliness. Not just, hey, knock it off, son, what are you doing? The Holy Spirit's like, son, this is going to ruin you if you keep going. If you keep doing these reps, your life is going to be ruined. Let me show you the way to life. Let's change this swing over to life to freedom, to joy, to peace, to the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And that's the word we use in in, in our faith, boys, is is repentance. That means change your swing. A good coach doesn't just say, hey, stop, stop swinging like that. A good coach says, let me show you how to actually swing. And so what I share with them is is that, you know, when it comes to say, um, so parents, this this is a freebie for you guys, right? When we talk to our kids and we confront them about their sin, I, I told the boys, like, it's not enough just to, to stop talking back to your parents. And that's good if they stop talking back to the parents, right? But it's putting off talking back and it's putting on kindness. It's putting on obedience. It's putting on joyful submission to your parents. It's putting on trust for your parents. And boys, that's the part that you can't do on your own. <laughs> maybe you're able to stop talking back, maybe, but putting on a joyful trust but your parents, you need God to do that in you. You need the Holy Spirit to work in you. And of course, they're, they're young. They don't understand all this stuff. I don't even understand all this stuff. But walking them through, look, to really change your swing, you need, you need a really great coach. And our best coach is Jesus. Our coach is God himself. And he gives us other coaches like our parents, but but. We have Christ as our example. And so when we look at hospitality, we look at face-to-face interaction and inviting ourselves into people's lives who are desperately hurting in life. He's our ultimate coach. He's the one who's looking at us going, son, I want you to change your swing. You're spending a lot more time doing this, this, and this. Your schedule's getting busy. You're not making any time for these people that I have allotted in your space and time. I want you to, to spend time with them to be more, just to be thinking more about people that don't know of this ransom, Jesus Christ. But we can't just want this church, we have to actually do constant practice, starting small. So I read to them from Colossians chapter three, verse five. This is just the idea of putting off, but then putting on. Paul says, put to death therefore what's earthly in you. I said, boys, that's your bad swings. And they gave me examples of bad swings. And you guys would, be, you would have loved hearing the examples, the things that they were really kind of confessing, talking back to your parents, being disrespectful, picking on their siblings. They were confessing a lot. It was, it was pretty, it was awesome. So I said, boys, we need to put to death our bad swings. So Paul says, put away all these things that are earthly in us, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry, On account of all these things, the wrath of God is coming. And these two, you once walked. These things should be in our past. And I told specifically the men, because some of the boys actually confessed anger, which I was really proud of them for confessing that. But then I called out to the dads. I said, dads, there is no place for unrighteous anger in a Christian man's life. Paul says that that should be a thing of the past. He says, on account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked. This shouldn't describe us today. I'm not saying we don't struggle with these things. But these things should be in our past. We should be putting off these things. We should be changing our swing. In these things too, you once walked when you were living in them. But now, now, today, now you must put them all away. Put away anger. Put away wrath, put away malice, put away slander and obscene talk from your mouth. Don't lie to one another, seeing that you've put off the old self. The old Joby should be dead and gone. You've put off the old self with its practices and you've, with, its, with its old reps. And you've put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. 
And here there is not Greek or Jew or circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free. Some of the boys, I didn't read that whole list of them. I said, there's no such thing as old boys and young boys here. Old men, young men. We're all sons of God. We're all his kids. I kept having them turn around. I had them all sit in front. I said, I want you to turn around. These, these are just older boys, right? They're your dads, they're your uncles, they're your grandpas, whatever. They're your dad's friends. But you guys have to understand, these are just old boys because we're all sons. We're sons. We're just, we're kids. We're just older and grayer and wrinklier than you guys. And so I kept reading. I said, put on then. So I said, boys, here's the new reps. This is the new swing. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if someone has a complaint against each other, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. So you also must forgive. And above all these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. So church, for us, then bring it back to this room here, we have to change our swing. And maybe it's a different things in here that you're looking at, you're going, man, that's, that's too present in my life still. But we have to put off, and we have to put on. Maybe we have to put off when it comes to hospitality, when it talks about face-to-face -face interaction with people. Maybe we have to put off some of our, our busyness. Maybe we have to put off some of our, our crammed schedules. Maybe we have to put off a little bit of our settling on digital connection. I'm not saying all digital connection. I'm not saying all busyness. But maybe we have to put off some of this. And instead we need to put on hospitality and people, relationships. And I'll say this too, that the word hospitality in the Bible doesn't usually just mean hanging out with your Christian buddies. That's usually the word fellowship. A lot of times when you see hospitality in the Bible, we're actually talking more about, I mean, think about the word hospitality. What's it connected to? Hospital. People who are hurting, which could also be Christians, obviously, but the ultimate people hurting in this world are sinners who do not yet know a Savior. Remember, Jesus came not for the healthy, but for the sick. And so hospitality used in the Bible is talking about bringing in outsiders into our home, into our lives, into our hearts. Again, it doesn't mean no Christians whatsoever, but Usually when we talk about hospitality, we're talking about bringing in outsiders who need help, who need a hospital, caring for people in need. That's usually the context, the lost. But it's everything. It's showing hospitality to your, your Christian brothers and sisters, but also let's not forget those on the outside. Because we also saw that Jesus' primary way in which he came to serve was to save the outsiders from the sickness of sin. And if we're made in his image, our mission should be similar, if not identical, other than the whole, you know, giving them salvation thing, because we can't do that. But our message is to serve the world with the message of salvation. But we can't do that if we're not face to face with them, getting to them, finding inroads, inviting them into our lives, into our calendars, into our homes, into our hearts, making ways, changing our reps so we can actually be eye to eye and face to face with these people with these folks that God has allotted their time and their boundaries to be within our allotted time and boundaries. So as we close up, I want you just to consider briefly just some of the inroads that we have in, in today's world, the people around you. I mean, it's just a, just a few. How many people do you know that don't know Jesus are looking for meaning and looking for purpose? All of them? Right? They're feeling their way around in the dark, trying to find their God, lowercase g, God. They're looking for meaning and purpose. How many people do you know in your life that don't know Jesus, or they're just looking for satisfaction in their life? Right? Can, can we speak to that? Can we speak, can we speak to meaning and purpose? I know I can. Can we speak to satisfaction? I know I can. How many people that you know that don't know Jesus, are, they have a desire to receive love from someone or someone's or society or whatever. They're looking for acceptance. Can you speak to that? I, I know the God who doesn't just have love, but the God who is love and who's accepted me, a sinner, alienated from him. 
I know that God. I, I can speak to that. How many people do you know that don't know Jesus are just looking and grasping for identity? Can you speak to that? If you find that inroad, you invite that person to your life somehow. I'm not saying these are the greatest like icebreaker conversations, right? Getting to know someone, hey, let's have coffee. Like, hey, tell me about your identity. I mean, that's, I'm not saying this is like the first date kind of a thing. What I'm saying is if you recognize that these are the things that people are dealing with, fear of death, whatever it might be, you go, okay, if I can find an inroad, maybe I can navigate around and feel my way in the dark towards that God of theirs. And maybe I can engage in a conversation if I first win their ears. But I gotta look at them face to face. I, I want them to know and see the smile on my face. I want, to, I want them to feel the embrace when I give them a hug, when I say goodbye. I want them to know truly, not just cerebrally, but know in their heart that I really care about them. I love them. They feel a hug, not just a you know, TTYL over text or whatever. Right? They, they, they're feeling an embrace the warmth of your body as you hug them or you shake their hand or whatever it is, that, that, go, that makes such a huge difference, church. In person, flesh to flesh. So we need to change our swing and we can start small. I'll give you a couple examples here and then we'll close in prayer. There's one thing I shared with the boys. I said, boys, I want you to finish this sentence for me. Practice makes, and they go, perfect. I said, wrong. And then they're all embarrassed and ashamed. No, I'm just kidding there. I said, boys, practice never makes perfect. That's impossible. But practice makes progress. Practice makes progress. By continual practice, Paul says, or the author of Hebrews said, I'm sorry. By continual practice, we gain wisdom. By training ourselves, we work towards godliness. We'll never become God, but we grow in godliness. Practice makes progress. So just a few things. This is something you guys can work into your schedules, work into just your values, but you have to start small. Just tweak a little part of your swing. Uh, just be more mindful. Have coffee with people. Right? People you see at, at the dance studio or, or at the soccer field or the baseball field, say, hey, let's go grab coffee. Uh, maybe it's play dates at the park. I, I know kids can be distracting. You can't have it. Maybe it's a lot of small talk and the kids keep interrupting whenever it's starting to get, get good. That's okay because you know what? God allotted that time for you. A lot of the time for you to have little ones right now that are going to be distracting and have a lot of needs. But that shouldn't stop us from still saying, I want to spend time with this person, even if it's just a bunch of small talk and we're super interrupted. Don't let that stop you. Again, you don't have to go from zero to 60 in one conversation. We're finding inroads here, we're, we're tweaking small parts of the swing. Their kids are going to be distracting too. It's fine. It's fine. But be consistent, constant practice. Maybe it's having dinner from, with people that are from, you know, from soccer or baseball or from school or from work. I mean, people are shocked these days when you invite them over for dinner, aren't they? Like, what, what, what do you mean? Like, like, like with you at your house? Like, that's weird. Right? I mean, that's what I'm saying. We have a great opportunity because this should be normal for us. It's not as much as it used to be, but it should be. And people, as apprehensive as they might be, like, this is, what, what are we going to do? What are we going to talk about? I don't know. Let's figure it out. People deep down want that connection. They want that kind of communion. They just, we've become more unfamiliar with it. So maybe set goals as a family, as a couple, maybe with your friends, maybe with your community group. Hold each other accountable. Don't beat yourself up if you don't meet your goals, whatever that is, but try to just put it on the calendar. Have it be a goal, not just a want or a desire, but start tweaking that swing a little bit. Have, have your, your kids' friends over. Invite the parents in when they drop the kids off. Not just, hey, see you later. Hey, we want to come in for a little bit. Stuff that, I mean, our parents used to do when we were kids. Simple stuff. And if the house is messy, the laundry's out, doesn't matter. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm, giving you, I'm giving you ladies permission. Doesn't matter if the house is messy. Right? It's not worth not connecting and having communion with someone who needs Jesus. Don't worry about the mess. The mess in their heart is far worse than the mess in your home. So don't let that be a, a roadblock to changing that swing. So um, if I can just read those two short verses before I pray here, I'm just gonna add in a word. I'm never intending to change scripture, just so you know, okay? Just don't, don't accuse me of changing scripture. But just to give us context, Paul speaking to Timothy, train yourself for the purpose of hospitality. Because hospitality is godly. 
We need to train ourselves for the purpose of hospitality. For those who have their powers of hospitality, we're trained by constant practice. Now, you want to have the power of really awesome hospitality towards outsiders? The author of Hebrews gives us this wisdom. Those who have the powers of hospitality are trained by constant practice. Practice it. Tweak that swing little by little. Practice it. Fumble in it. Make mistakes. Let it be awkward. Let it be awkward. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the fact that you, God, are the most ultimate hospitable God. Putting off all of the, the great glory that you, you had and this perfect, this perfect communion, Father, Son, and Spirit, you, you set that aside and lowered yourself and became one of us and entered into our world, assigned to yourself a lot of times and boundaries for you to live within so that you could interact face to face with outsiders and those who are lost, who are in need of a hospital. Lord, we want to do the same. We want to be like you, but we know we can't just want this and desire this. We need to train ourselves for the purpose of godliness. By constant practice, we want to work this into our lives so that we would grow in these things. And fully understanding that because of our allotted time and boundaries, we know that we might not have as much time as this person or that person. We don't compare ourselves to others because we're all in different allotted times. Whether we have small kids or maybe we don't have great health, maybe we travel out for work, we don't have to look like the person next to us, but we wanna be good stewards of what you have given us in our allotted time. So we thank you, God, for the great example that you've been to us through Jesus Christ, the example you've given us through Paul and through others, both in your word and through church history. And help us, God, just find that, that deep-rooted identity that really is in us, is to be hospitable people because that's who you are and we are made in your image. Help us to become what you've already created us to be, hospitable people, welcoming people, in-person people. We thank you, Lord. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.